Andrew, excellent. Game's place, my place, tonight. Yeah, you're off to the football. No, that'll be good. Yeah, excellent. Oh, here it's going to be a great game. Fantastic. Oh, game's place, my place, tonight. Are you up for it? You're in Western Australia. How long have you been in Western Australia for? You moved three months ago. Lee, game's place, my place, tonight. You up for it? No, no, that's... No, look, I'm sorry. That's completely my fault. I'm... Sorry about that. Look, uh, my condolences and uh, my my prayers and, and best wishes are with you and your family at this time. Ricky, games place, my place tonight. You up for it? Excellent. We're in. Good. It's going to be a great evening. Yeah, it's just going to be the two of us. Since having a child and becoming a father, I've not been able to have the game nights that I used to have. Gone are the days of just being able to, at a whim, pull together a group of people and sit down and play a bunch of games. However, what I do have is the availability of one or two friends who can come around occasionally and we like to sit down and play, well, games with just two players. Today I want to talk about some of my favourite two-player games and what I'm specifying is that they are in fact two-player games and not games that I just like playing with two players. That would be an entirely different list. So we're just going to stick to the set of games that are specifically two players only. While this is no means a definitive list of two-player games, I think it is a relatively strong list of good contenders for games that you might like. Certainly they're games that I love, and I hope that you yourself might get some benefit out of playing them. With that said, let's begin with the first 1999 classic Lost Cities by one of my favourite designers, Reiner Knizia. Now, Lost Cities has the rather light conceit of being archaeologists on expeditions. However, it should really be considered an abstract game. You have to play cards in order from 2 to 10. You've got handshake cards, which double the scores of the decks. You've got to create sets of cards, trying to not uh, skip any numbers if you can in the set. It creates this good tension. There's always this good tension of, I play cards and I can draw from either the discard pile or from the deck each turn. Now, if I discard a card for my turn, that card can be picked up by my opponent. There are five different colors, and if I'm trying to collect the red color set and I go from four to six, that means I can't put in five. And it's at that point, usually, if you're ever playing me, it's pretty much precisely at that point that you will either play or discard the five. It's a wonderful two-player game. It's, it's so light, but at the same time, there's a lot to think about. It's genuinely fun. It's very popular. It's usually on the top 10 couples list games and that sort of thing. It's certainly one to check out. I really enjoy Lost Cities. Uh, of course, Reiner Knizia, who I generally tend to put with dice games, has hit it out of the park with this card game. Next on my list is the 2009 Asthma Day release Jaipur. Designed by Sabastine Pouchon, Jaipur is a set collection game, but set in the realm of a market space. You're trading goods, you're trying to collect certain goods, and you're trying to build the best market space. You, you want to collect certain goods and then sell them to market, uh, which is usually sets of three, four, or five cards. Now, obviously, the more cards in a set that you collect, the more you get, but there's a little bit of a race on as you try and sell goods and collect enough money because the, the turn could end before you actually get to sell your goods if you're constantly constantly just holding on and waiting out for the right goods. There's also this wonderful mechanic where you have to either, if you're taking from the market, take one card that you need or take all of the camel cards or trade cards of two, three, four cards from the market space, but re replacing them with cards of your own. Now the sets you collect are actually important. So it's not that each set scores you the same. You are trying to make the best deals with what you've got. And it becomes this really good trade-off of, do I hold out? Do I play now? Do I try and rush through and, and get a few sets? And for some reason, I, I just seem to be enjoying this theme of, uh, you know, marketplaces for some reason. Yeah, go figure. Next up is a game that I have only just played in the last few weeks, and that's Seven Wonders Duel. Released in 2015 by Repost Games, it was designed by Antoine Bowser and Bruno Cathala, two brilliant game designers based, of course, on the original game by Antoine Bowser, Seven Wonders. It picks up on a lot of the themes and the symbols, and it gives you that in in that way where you've got that familiarity with the game, but I really see it as a completely different game. There's the 
drafting element, but the drafting element is so different, uh, it, it doesn't feel like a Seven Wonders style drafting scenario. However, it's a wonderful little drafting mechanic where you set the cards up in certain ways. There's some cards that are visible, some cards that aren't. Creates those tension moments of trying to work out, oh, I'm going to rely on some of those face down cards being the cards that I need. And there's, of course, multiple ways to actually win this game. So you can go for a full science victory, you can go for points victory, you can go for a military victory. Having those options there, I feel, really creates a good sense of not only I feel I have power as a decision maker in the game, but I'm also having to watch my opponent to ensure that they're not streaking ahead too far. And a couple of times it actually came down to the wire where I was really pushing for one specific strategy just to try and get it through. And I nearly got there all but for one card, which my opponent managed to to wrestle away from me through some very clever playing. I really like it because I feel like I'm the cards I choose are important. I'm not just picking a card to throw into my tableau, I'm trying to find the best cards. I'm trying to think of how to use the cards best. And in fact, the cards can be used in a couple of different ways, giving them just a little bit of versatility that makes that adds depth to that decision-making process. So Seven Wonders Duel is definitely one that I think, just for the price of it, it's worth having in your collection. It's just a wonderful two-player game. It can play in less than 30 minutes. It's very easy to learn, very easy to set up, pack down, uh, takes no time at all. Wonderful game, highly recommend it. Now, Mihao Orach has really been designing some great games of late and starting to hit his stride, I feel. However, back in 2006, he designed one of the best two-player games around, Nirishima Hex. It's this wonderful little drafting game with tiles and you're on this uh, grid and you're in this confined space and it's almost like this programming game. It mixes tile lane with programming. It's a two-player combative game. You're trying to attack each other's bases. And so you have this scenario where you're trying to destroy each other's base, but you have to attack it and you have to get through each other's armies. The, the variety in the game is wonderful. The, the armies feel different in terms of how you would play them. The, the different powers are wonderful and it feels when I first started like it was going to be overwhelming but in the end it really wasn't. The real challenge I find is trying to think enough turns ahead so you can see how all the programming is going to work out and then trying to lay tiles that somehow overcome or circumvent what programming is going to happen for your opponent and then at some point someone's going to discover the right tile or the board's going to be completely filled. All the action takes place at once. There's this big build up and then just all this action all at once. It's completely insane. You just watch the board slowly disintegrate in front of you and it's completely fun watching that happen. The game Patchwork released in 2014 by Uwe Rosenberg is a little bit of a step back than what the last few have and it's, it's more of the abstract style game that I, I tend to enjoy abstract. I don't, I don't know why, but I do. Patchwork must have one of the dullest themes around of you are making a patchwork quilt. But make no mistakes, this game will have you wrapped at the idea of making a patchwork quilt. Now you have a scoring board, which is also your timing mechanic. And every time you purchase a piece, you move down the scoreboard a little bit, or if you can't purchase a piece, you have to move ahead of your opponent by one square to collect enough buttons so that you can purchase your next piece. And so each turn forces you to move through the game and forces the game along to its conclusion, which is just a very clever design mechanism. The pieces you buy are Tetra style pieces that you have to fit into a player board. And you, so you can't just buy uh, single squares or lines that all fit in nicely. You have to try and find a way to make the pieces you can purchase fit. And so sometimes that means buying the less optimal piece to make the best placement on your board. In some senses, you're losing ground, but you're also uh, gaining ground because it means better scoring at the end. At the end of the game, you get scored for all the buttons in your quilt, as well as for all the all the spaces that are taken up and you lose points for any spaces that are available. So being able to fill your board is a really important strategy to work towards. This game is just good to look at. Uh, it plays well. It's got some good depths of strategy, some good play interaction. It's good. It's fun to look at what's 
what's left at the end of the game to see the quilts that you've made. It's just a really clever game and I've not really played any game like it. A very good design by Uwe Rosenberg and it's nice to see him going back to some of the more lighter games that he was known for before he went ventured into Agricola and Caverna and games like that. The 2001 game Hive by John Yanni, released by Asmodee, is this very clever tile laying game where the tiles you're laying down are actually bugs and each bug has a different ability or or strength and you can you can choose to either lay a tile down which is putting another bug into the hive or you can try and move use the abilities or the movements of the bugs to manipulate the hive and to to move the hive around and the reason you want to do that is because your ultimate goal is to surround the opponent's queen bee as well as stopping your opponent from doing the same to you it's a multi award winning game including the mensa award which means that really smart people like playing it too doesn't really mean i'm really smart for playing it i just like to play it because it's fun one of the things i found is that it's really accessible too i've played this with grade four, grade five, grade six kids, and they've all put up really good challenges for me. At the end of the day, I do think it's a game where strength and strategy and skill will always win out against luck. But at the same time, it is a good game for to learn your logical thinking, to learn your planning, to learn how to set up a board and how to really try and use the pieces. It carries with it a kind of uh, chess-like feel to it, but at the same time being far more engaging, far more fun. John Doherty and Darwin Castle in 2014 released the game Star Realms. Published by White Wizard Games, this was a two-player game that could be built out to four players if you bought extra decks and played them together. I never bothered because the two-player version was plenty good. It takes the ascension drafting mechanic of having the center row where, which cards are played into. You can build themes, you can have multiple different factions. Some factions work better with other factions and some factions work better on their own. The, the different color coding makes it really simple to know what sort of abilities you can expect from the different factions. Player on player, trying to uh, utilize the best of deck building to bring down your opponent's authority and to outright win was just it was good it was really good smooth mechanics it was very well done it's so easy to play and so much fun with real good challenge involved mitigating the the challenge of the randomness of the the deck and the center row balancing that out with strategy and skill it's a really good mix for a game and i just in terms of deck builders it's certainly up there as one of my favorites 2004 saw the release of dungeon twister designed by christoph bollinger and published by asma day now some of the strengths of this game is the hidden information versus known information that both players have an insight into the state of play before the game begins all of the dungeon tiles are set face down so there's no real ability to know what the dungeon is going to look like ultimately but you know where items and characters will appear in the dungeon because you take turns placing them into there. You've got your four starting characters at the end, so it becomes this interesting mix of, well, what do you what do you hope to do in trying to move through the dungeon? I just have to get my pieces through the dungeon and out my opponent's side, or I have to kill my opponent's pieces to score points. First person to five points is the winner. Games can stretch out for an hour, but not often. The gameplay is fascinating, not just because you've got to try and get your pieces to the end while avoiding your your opponent's pieces. There's a few key mechanics which I just find add to the depth of decision making. Yes, the hidden information's good, but each turn I have to make a choice between how many actions I'm going to take in my turn. But the number of actions I get each turn is dependent on the cards that I choose to play. Both players have the same number of cards, but on this turn my opponent might only take three actions where I might take five actions. However, that means that I can't take my f that five actions again until I've used up all the other action cards that I have, which will mean that at some point I will have to take three actions. This is important because although over the course of the rounds we take the similar number of actions, it might mean that in one round I could really push hard take down a couple of my opponent's characters or push a few of my characters out through my opponent's end and score those vital points. Or I can be reserved and save them up to try and uh, sort of push my opponent into a bit of a corner so I can then attack them later. So even that becomes part of the strategy. But then there's also the 
style of attack that goes on where it matters if your players are next to support characters or it matters which cards you play because there's no dice rolling. It comes down to what my strength is versus your defense and what cards I intend to play. Once I play those cards, they are gone from the game. I cannot get them back. And so each attack movement holds real weight. There's a real risk involved. There's just this really intense buildup in the game uh, and good scrupulous decision making to be had. And it's just something that really gets to me. I really enjoy uh, good rich decision making where the decisions aren't clear or the state of play isn't necessarily obvious or apparent to me. So I have to really think through my moves and that for some reason really makes a good game for me. So I love that about this game and this game does it in spades. Mike Elliott, Brian Kinsala, and Ethan Pasternak bring fleet captains. And I have to say, it's not just because it's Star Trek that I love this game. Released in 2011 by WizKids, Star Trek Fleet Captains has player versus player where you are exploring space. You are playing either Starfleet or you're playing Klingons before the time of Federation where the Klingons join the Federation. And it's intense, like it's really intense, but there's completely different ways of playing the game. Federation will generally be about trying to score victory points using science and exploration, whereas the Klingons will be better honed towards trying to attack and uh, aggressively take ground. But that doesn't mean that you are pigeonholed into those explicit strategies. You can still score points via attacking or, or being aggressive if you want. The setup is extensive. The cards you choose, the sorts of decks you choose will ultimately contribute to the sort of play that you intend to take into the game. This game comes with significant risk. Again, the whole board is face down. So there, there's no knowledge necessarily of what you're flying into. So exploration becomes really important. You don't want to just rush through. The Klingons have uh, cloaking technology, which gives them certain benefits and abilities and, and makes them really threatening in the game. Like you really don't know if you're about to fly into uh, a Klingon or if you're about to engage a Spectre. These things really build up the tension. It feels like a good Star Trek episode where I am a captain exploring space, making scientific discoveries, looking for uh, weird and interesting things or trying to achieve certain scientific goals. Or as a Klingon, maybe having to do some of that, but also aggressively going after my opponents. Fleet Captains doesn't have necessarily the best quality components, but as WizKids sort of said in an interview with Tom Vassell that if they didn't have components which weren't quite as good, they wouldn't be able to put the game at an affordable price. So I kind of get that and I accept that and I'm okay with it because the game is just that good. I have a lot of fun playing this game. I really feel like I'm a part of a a scientific exploration while playing this game. It should come as no surprise to anyone watching this what my number one two-player game is. It's Twilight Struggle. Designed by Anata Gupta and Jason Matthews, this 2005 game just has everything for me. It has area control. It has intense political drama. It utilizes his history in a way which I love, where it's real history in a board game being played out. It has these really intense, difficult decisions to make over whether whether the cards I play uh, will bring about my certain ruin or my, my absolute victory. There's multiple paths to victories. There's a whole end game you have to start thinking about during the early game. The decision making is intense, it's real, it matters. There's elements of luck involved that just seem to fit the style of gameplay going on. You get to make political coups and, and realignment roles and there's just so much to do and so much to think about. But at the same time, it, it really adds to this Cold War feel of trying not to bring about the destruction of the Earth while at the same time just trying to do enough to get advantage over your opponent. There's this stranglehold that slowly takes place over the course of the game. I really feel that despite the randomness of some of the elements of the game, the better player will win out in the end. In fact, I've written a few things up about this. I've written a few things on Gamerpalooza, Dot com dot au. So if you're interested in checking out any of those articles, please go there and check that out. James, that was a good segue. Also go and check out Instagamers Network. They have released their, their latest video on uh, abstract games. There's a really good list of games there and some really good reviewers. I really strongly recommend you go check that out. And if you are on Instagram, 
person, then go on Instagram and follow those people. Speaking of which, if you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you're new to this channel, please hit that subscribe button. Another good segue. My name's Dave Adams, and that's what's happening now. Yeah.